Hi, everyone. Welcome to Explorer Classroom. I'm Joe Gorebski from National Geographic, coming at you live uh, from the exploration vessel Nautilus. I'm here with the Ocean Exploration Trust, which was founded by National Geographic Explorer at large, Dr. Robert Ballard. You may know him as the discoverer of the Titanic and hydrothermal vents. And the whole purpose is to engage in pure ocean exploration. So using exploration vessel Nautilus, they explore areas of the ocean that have never been explored or are poorly understood. So the goal of this mission uh, was to explore the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We were at one point doing some dives 80 miles off the coast of Monterey, California, which was within the borders of the sanctuary. And the area of focus was to be Davidson Seamount, which is one of the largest seamounts in U.S. waters, 26 miles long and eight miles across. Today, we're going to learn a little about, about the Ocean Exploration Trust, the EV Nautilus, what we're doing here and how the ROVs are helping us learn more about the difficult to explore places in the ocean. So as I mentioned, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'm a Science Communication Fellowship on board the Nautilus. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. I'm also an explorer with National Geographic. And today I'm joined by... Hi, I'm Jessica Sandoval. I'm one of the Argus pilots here on board and I work with the ROVs day in and day out. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna share our screen. We have a little presentation prepared. We'll kind of show you a little bit of what we're up to, what we've seen, and Jess will talk a little bit more, of course, about piloting the ROVs and just what's involved. So bear with me for just one moment while we bring that up. All right. So keep my eyes out. Give me big thumbs up when we see the Nautilus on the screen. I'm thinking it's there. It looks like it. Yeah, lots of thumbs. All right, excellent. So we'll go full screen. So as I mentioned, Exploration Vessel Nautilus, it's a pretty cool ship. It's one of two in the world that's dedicated exclusively to exploration. So it's 211 feet long, which is 64 meters. We've got a crew of 30 science uh, individuals, a science team on board, and 17 crew members running the day-to-day -day things like the engine, the captain and his mates, uh, preparing food, and things like electrical engineers. So a pretty big uh, crew on board. So the Nautilus takes a two-tiered approach to exploration. So this little video is gonna illustrate the first part, but we do have a map here of the sanctuary. So the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is about 270 miles long if you were driving, covers about 6,000 uh, square miles of the ocean. And the area that we were really interested in is down here uh, to the southwest, we have Davidson Seamount. So this is an extinct volcano that last erupted about 9.8 million years ago. And our first dive took place in the area here to the southeast of the seamount. And we'll share a little bit about that in a moment. So the two-tiered uh, method of exploration. First, we find an unexplored area of the seafloor and we use multi-beam sonar to map it. So you can see the difference here in this video between single and multi-beam. The single just does a little bit, but the multi-beam, we can get a wide range of the ocean. So we spend a little bit of time going over the area. We look at targets we might be interested in diving uh, on with the ROVs. We get a little bit of a picture like this. And now we can go down with the ROVs to take picture, to take video, and even take samples for the scientists. And I'll let Jess take over for a couple minutes and tell us a little bit about the ROVs. All right. So this is uh, one of the two. Actually, you can see both ROVs in this picture here. Uh, so this yellow one here, his name is Hercules. He lives... Well, he lives on deck, but he rather goes and explores the seafloor up and close and gets some nice personal shots um, of any sea creatures or any interesting geological features. As you can see, Hercules has a bunch of lights, a bunch of cameras on it, and two manipulators, we call them. And so these manipulators are like arms that are used in order to take samples from the seafloor. Um, and then behind Hercules, you can see Argus. And Argus is used as a separation from the ship movements uh, between the ship and Hercules. This allows some stable shots between, um, between, from Hercules and allows for some stability that we can provide them. Um, so as you can see here in this animation, uh, Argus is bobbing up and down in the water and it's obviously attached to the ship by a steel cable, we call it, so it's very rigid. Um, but it allows for a disassociation of movement uh, between Hercules and, and the ship. Um, and so this here is the control van. And so up in the front row, we have our navigator to the far right. We have in the middle, we have the Herc pilot. And then to the, to the side here on the left is the Argus pilot. So this is uh, the front row, um, at least to the left of the, and to the right of the control van. Um, 
And so this here you can see is a, a, a controller box or a joy box um, that has all the controls for controlling Hercules. So Hercules has six thrusters on it, allowing it to move any which direction we want it to go in the water. Um, and so we can control the thrusters from this joy box here. So I have to ask, Jess, I've heard some people say that if you can play video games, you could be well on your way to piloting Herc. Is that true or is there a little more involved than that? Right. No, um, if, you, if you like video games, and even if you don't, uh, either way, uh, if you have an ability to begin to think about this 3D space, even from a lot of cameras, it's, it's, uh, if you're able to stitch together those images, um, both video game players and non-video game players are, are more than welcome. I actually don't play a lot of video games, but I sure love this job. So. All right. <laughs> um, and over here we have, to the, to the right of the screen, we have a, we call it a craft controller. And so this is basically one of the arms on the vehicle is this control is the arm on the vehicle. Um, and so we hold this large apparatus, if you will, in our hands, and we're able to control very finely and precisely the manipulators uh, on the sea floor. Very cool. All right, so pretty excited to have these on board. We have two of National Geographic's drop cams, basically high definition cameras in a glass sphere. You can see at the bottom here, we have a little cylinder. We put the bait in to attract marine life. Then we have a line uh, and it's anchored to a pillowcase full of sand. So we hoist it up and the one we're using is called BB. We hoist BB up over the water. You can see the lights here. And then we drop BB in, BB sinks down to over 3,000 meters, and for the next six hours, we'll take footage from the bottom. And then when that time is up, uh, BB will be released from the weights, we'll float to the surface, and then we'll do our best to pick BB out from the sea and then download the video content. So we've done two launches so far. One was to about 3,400 meters, and we got have some cool images. I think I have some here next. Yeah, so we have a grenadier here, also called a rat tail. So tons of these fish in the deep sea, they were really interested in the bait. And then we also have a cusk eel. And this is one of the larger fish that we saw. You can see how it kind of gets that name. It's actually a fish. It looks a little bit like an eel uh, as you move towards uh, the end. And so we saw lots of those. Yesterday's drop was only about 500 meters. We saw lots of marine snow, but we did catch a glimpse of a shark cruising past. And we think it might've been a six gill shark. So that's pretty exciting. So just a few images from one of the dives that we have been able to do. This is a sea spider. Jess, what is up with these lasers up here? <laughs> so those lasers, um, those are used in order to measure whatever is underwater. So those lasers are uh, 10 centimeters apart. Um, and it allows us to get a, an understanding of how big that sea spider is, for instance. All right. So they're 10 centimeters. That one's probably somewhere between 20 and 30 centimeters uh, in diameter. Pretty cool. And you get to turn them on and off, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We turn lots of stuff on and off <laughs> underwater. All right. So this is something that gave the ROV pilots a little scare um, <laughs> on the first dive. What is this, Jess, and why did it get your attention? Oh, yeah. So that there is something you don't see all the time on the seafloor, and that's actually a bunch of uh, fishing line and fishing nets, and that's something you don't want to be caught up in. No. Certainly not. I mean, neither for a fish, nor for an ROV, nor for a human. So when we saw that, we... Uh, diverted our route, if you will. We kept an eye on it, make sure that the vehicles were clear of this entanglement hazard, meaning that you can get yourself caught up and potentially leave your ROVs down there if you're not doing, if you're not doing Yeah, right. I don't imagine a rescue at 3,400 meters is easy for the ROVs. No, we were quite deep on that one, but still these fishing gear was able to be present. So that, mm -hmm. was, that was an unfortunate find there. Yeah, and they call that ghost fishing. So even though it's not still being used by humans, it can still entangle marine life for years to come. This is pretty neat. You can see we have a whole bunch of sea pigs on the bottom. Uh, actually, they're sea cucumbers. And then you can see some sea urchins. And they're pretty excited because there is some kelp here. So there is no sunlight. So the energy comes down from the surface, but in the form of something called marine snow. And you can see the sediment all over here. So the marine snow is organic matter that slowly sinks to the bottom. But every once in a while, something bigger, like a piece of kelp, comes to the bottom. And then it's an all-you-can-eat buffet uh, for the sea life for a short period of time. Really excited to see this lizard fish. I think we only saw one or two over the whole 35 hour dive. Um, you can see it's a good ambush predator with a nice big mouth with eyes facing upwards. You can also see one of its uh, adaptations here, a lateral line along the body uh, that helps it detect pressure changes in the water. Pretty important when you can't see under underwater when the visual doesn't make any difference. 
and a little more evidence of human activity. So we saw some rusted paint cans, the fishing net. Uh, I think we saw a yellow balloon during our dive at oh, one yeah. point. And then this Dr. Pepper can is another evidence that even though we're far from shore, 80 miles in an environment very difficult for humans to reach, our impact can still be felt. And then Jess, do you want to talk a little bit about the sampling? Yeah, so this is an example of sampling uh, sponges. So this here, although it looks like a tulip, is actually a sponge. Um, and so we have these, as we said, manipulators, which act as our arms that are very precise in how they move. And so you're able to take samples of very delicate things, like a sponge, for instance, um, and corals and rocks and all these things. And it acts, we have these things called parallel jaws, meaning that as we close them, closes in a parallel line uh, to the object that it's grasping. And we can actually change how hard we close. So on this grab, for instance, I think I grabbed this at a, at a lower grip force, meaning that it grips it a little bit softer, if you will, for a delicate specimen. And I think I asked you, is it 500 pounds per square inch? What's the max that you can? So don't quote me on this, but um, from my understanding, it's 500 pounds of grip force total okay. across the entire, uh, entire manipulator. But uh, uh, don't quote me on this. All right. <laughs> um, and then this here, this is actually a, a suction sampler, we call it. Uh, we're basically taking a vacuum and we're, we're taking a sample of the very, very delicate things that might break off um, in the manipulator. And so we take a vacuum grab of this, if you will, and we store it in a jar on the top of Hercules. And this one, we're taking a vacuum sample of sponges again. So not just the kitchen sink sponges, but uh, these are a little bit different, uh, made out of silica, I believe. So. That's right, skeletons of glass, which is pretty amazing. They can use minerals and other materials in the water to make those skeletons. Mm -hmm. We do have a sponge expert on board named Amanda, and she's been pretty excited this whole crew. She got some pretty good specimens from that dive. Mm. Oh, this, this, I believe this is a coral, is this? Ah, uh, stocked crinid. Ah, uh, stocked yeah. crinid. Yeah. Oh, okay, see. This is why we need the biologists on board, yeah? Um, so this is another example of another type of grab, and we're putting this into the front uh, toolbox, we call it, or bio box. Um, so as you can see, there's these white drawers that come out, and um, we're able to control um, putting them away and stowing our samples so they don't float out, especially for these delicate specimens like this stock crinoid here. Um, another beautiful grab, though. Yeah, absolutely. And then on our way up, you can see there's a, is it called the porch? Mm -hmm. Up front yep. here, yeah, we've got this milk crate for taking some samples of the rock for some of the geologists who are really interested in what's going on in the area. And then you got to do something kind of cool on our on our way up. Do you remember on the ascent when you got to let loose oh, some yes. weight? We also, <laughs> seems like a while ago now. It was a while ago. Um, yeah, so we also have these things. Um, we call them plates. Uh, Alvin weights is another colloquial term for them. And basically, they're a bunch of uh, steel plates that were... Um, able to shed if we take too many rock samples. Uh, not too many rock samples, if we take some rock samples, it changes how we float in the water and we want to be we want to be somewhat positive in the water. So that if we were to sever, sever the tether, that's between Hercules and Arius, that Hercules would eventually float up in the water column because it is positively buoyant or it means that it floats in water. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so in order to do that, we uh, take off these lead plates, or sorry, these steel plates. Um, and the nice thing about steel is that it will eventually dissolve over time in water. Yep. And we have this type of line on it called twine. Um, and it's a natural fiber, so that actually also just degrades over time in water as well. So it's not plastic. We're uh, reducing our footprint that way. Perfect. So the last little image just to share is a little bit of the biodiversity. So you can see we have a sea cucumber, a sea enemy. We have an acorn worm. A little bit of example of some deep sea coral. And then these can be called feather stars or swimming crinids because unlike the one that's on a stalk, these ones can actually move through the water. And it's kind of neat to see them uh, moving through the water. So the last little bit to share for you is some exciting videos near the tail end of the dive. And you can see why we are pretty excited about this. So this here you may have heard referred to as a Dumbo octopus. Maybe you've heard it referred to as an umbrella squid, and in just a minute, you'll see why. The scientific name is Grimpotuthis, and although those, those do look like ears like Dumbo in Disney, they're actually fins that help it move through the water, and now you can get a little peek at why uh, it might be called the umbrella octopus. So we are pretty excited. Uh, we had a, a, a minute or two we could stick around 
it seemed happy to show off for us for a couple of minutes. The scientists were excited. This video went viral really quickly on YouTube and Facebook. And another shot here. Pretty cool. So after that, we went a little bit further and we started to see a different octopus species. These ones were called Moose Octopus Robustus. And first we saw one or two kind of hanging out at the bottom, nothing unusual. Then we saw a group of about a dozen and they were all turned over with their mouths facing up and their tentacles facing up. And we were trying to figure out what was going on. Were they maybe defending themselves? Were they resting? We got a little bit closer and noticed that they were likely all female and they were protecting their eggs. They were brooding their eggs. They were keeping them safe, keeping dirt off, letting, making sure enough oxygen got over. So that was pretty exciting. And then we noticed the shivering in the water, which we don't know for sure because we couldn't take a temperature reading, but we think it might be warm water seeping out from uh, below the earth, from between the rocks. And they might like that because it flows more oxygen over their eggs. It keeps them a little bit warmer. So we still have a lot to learn about these uh, octopus. We went a little bit further and a dozen turned into dozens, turned into over a hundred, turned into well over a thousand of these female octopus all over the sea floor uh, in every nook and cranny in the shimmering water brooding their eggs. It's pretty darn exciting. It's only been witnessed once before, I think it was in Costa Rica, but it was only about a hundred and the water conditions were really different. So scientists have to come down, we have to take a look again and just try and figure out what's going on. All right, so I'm gonna end the share screen now and I'm gonna come back. We should be back in a second. Can everybody see us again? Give me a wave if you can see us. All right, oh, yeah. that's pretty positive. <laughs> All right, well, let's start meeting some of our classrooms. Let me turn our first microphone on. Mrs. Lindsay's class, grade seven eights, joining us in Littleton. How are we doing, grade seven eights? <laughs> All right, who's got the first question? So do you know if microscopic pieces of plastic are harming the waterways as much as the larger pieces of plastic are? And um, do you see a lot of plastic when you're diving? Okay. Jess, do you want to tackle the first part? You've been, obviously been flying ROVs a lot longer than me. How much do you encounter plastics? Oh, <laughs> yes. So we actually encounter plastics, I would say, more frequently than not. So I remember one dive we found a recycling bin on the seafloor, and it was face up and a bunch of anemones growing in it. But you're right, though. There are macro, there's large plastics and smaller plastics, like microplastics. And I actually do a fair bit of work as well, because I'm also doing my PhD at the same time. I do a fair bit of work also in microplastics work. And these are actually very potent because they're able to take in chemicals, much like a sponge from the water. Um, and by doing this, when organisms eat it, from small organisms up to big organisms, it really starts to get into the food chain and something we can't see. And so it's hard to, to have numbers on and quantify. So I think you're spot on though, exactly right, that microplastics are really actually quite potent and, um, and harmful. Yeah, it can so. be deceiving sometimes too because the when plastic does get into the ocean, it photodegrades, which means it breaks into smaller pieces, making those microplastics, and then they're harder to see and they sink. So they do get down to the deep sea environment, those microplastics, yeah. and they are having an impact, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think Amanda told me yesterday that she heard of a study uh, more towards the Antarctic and 40% of their water samples had microplastics in it and they were diving pretty deep. Yeah. So yeah, we just had a colleague actually go up to um, up to the Arctic, up to the North Pole. And, um, and up there when we process all the samples for microplastics, we also found a bunch of microfibers that's come out in the in our sweaters the synthetics in our sweaters and in our clothing. Um, so we, we actually saw a bunch of microfibers microplastics even in North Pole waters. So yeah, that's a fantastic question because it is a problem that we just keep on finding more and more information on. Absolutely. And to throw one more statistic at you uh, before we jump to another class, roughly 9 million tons of plastic are dumped into our ocean each year, which is equivalent to one dump truck a minute of plastic. So it is a real big problem. We need to find a way to stop using those single-use plastics, turn it off at the source, so we're putting less into our oceans. Great question. So we'll swing back in a moment, but we're going to meet Mrs. Simon's class, grade seven and eights, joining us in Chatham, Ontario. How are we doing today, Chatham? Good. 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 
Dorian. 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 Have you found any uh, rare species or picked up anything rare on your trips? All right, that's a great question. Oh, yeah. So we have, in fact. Um, so you may not know too much about sponges, but sponges uh, are animals, but they're pretty unique because they don't have a nervous system or a heart or lungs or eyes or a brain. They basically sit in the water and they filter the water. But they're pretty important because what they're filtering out is things like bacteria, which they can eat, turn into waste, which is then food for more animals further up the food chain. So a sponge can filter up to 900 times its volume in a day. So picture a sponge about this big, filtering out 900 times its size worth of water. They're pretty incredible. So we picked up some species of sponges uh, for our scientists. They basically have a wish list and they sit in the back and they tell the ROV pilots, I want that, I want that, mm -hmm. or get pictures of that, get video of that. Um, and then Jess and the other ROV pilots do their best to grab the sample yeah. and then we're able to bring it to the surface. So. There's some samples, we won't know for a while, but potentially could be new species, but it takes months to even years for scientists to look at them, compare them, look at their DNA, and decide if they are a new species or not. And we did find some species of carnivorous sponges. So sponges that don't filter feed as much anymore, they can actually entangle things in the water and slowly dissolve them. So <laughs> that's not the way I wanna go. No, no, not by a carnivorous no. sponge. Yeah, and, and there are some really interesting creatures as well. I mean. It, there are some worms in the water column. There, there are so many creatures that we don't even know what they're doing or who they are yet. And so that's why we take samples of them. Corals as well. I mean, yep. Things that live for a very long time on the seafloor. And um, so when we go down there, I would say the majority of things that we are seeing, we know, we know many different types of species that are down there, but we certainly are just touching mm -hmm. the tip of the iceberg and what's, what's yeah. being discovered. And that's tough too. It's hard to call something rare because we don't get down as much as we'd like to. We have better maps of Mars and the moon than we do of the bottom of our ocean. So we have so much work to do. It's a career field that anybody in sciences could think about getting into and there's still lots to explore, lots to discover. Okay. So really good question. All right, oops, where's my mouse? Mrs. Pierce's class, they're joining us from Winnetka, Wisconsin, grade fives. How are we doing grade fives? Okay. So, what is the most um, what's like the uh, most creatures you find on there? Like, what's the most common one you see? The most the common, most common that we see. Ooh. What do you think, Jess? What do you see the most? Oh well, let's see here. That's a very good question. Depending on where we're at, it changes. We see lots of hagfish in the water um, on the sea floor. And hagfish are a type of, oh, actually, I love hagfish. They're they are of, pretty cool. They're a type of fish that, um, that like to eat a lot of, um, for lack of a better word, fallen organisms. Um, so things that come down that die in the, up, up in the water column, they come down, they settle. You see always lots of hagfish that are growing on them, or not growing, but they're feeding on them, rather. And they can tie their bodies up into knots, and they can... Uh, exude a lot of uh, slime, if you will, and mucus as a defense mechanism. We also see lots of uh, sea stars, or sorry, not sea stars, but sea brittles. Uh, brittle stars, there we go. Oh, oh <laughs> goodness. Um, rat tail fish as well. So different different types of organisms, but some of them are, have come on trend. Yeah, and it was interesting. The dive started over sediments. We saw lots of sea pigs. Mm, lots yeah. of sea pigs, lots of urchins to start. Once we got to the rock, things kind of changed a little bit. We saw more sponges, more deep sea corals. Um, and then right at the end, I mean, it was like an octopus garden, well over a thousand moose octopus. And as we were slowly ascending, you could look out in the distance and see more and more. So yeah. a lot left to explore there. Great question. And then we'll jump to our final class joining us live, Mrs. Jerome's class. They're joining us from Kelowna in British Columbia, grade six class. How are we doing Kelowna? <laughs> How long have you been piloting the ROVs and what kind of training did you need to like pilot them? Yeah, well, that's a wonderful question. Great question. So this is my fourth season out. It's my fourth year. Um, and actually, I started out here as an intern. So I came out four years ago as an intern for my first year. And um, 
really before before coming out as an intern, I didn't have any ROV background. So I learned everything, got trained up on, on the job out here, and ever since I come back as a contractor. So three years as a contractor, one year as an intern uh, is, my, is my answer. Um, in order to lead up to that, that point, uh, when I came out as an intern, I was just finishing up my undergraduate uh, education. Um, and so I did my undergraduate in biological engineering at MIT. And since then, I'm, and since then in, the, in the time I'm not here, I got my master's in mechanical engineering and now I'm doing my PhD. Um, so that's kind of the route that I took to get here, but we have actually lots of internship opportunities. That's right. So if you go to nautiluslive.org, that's where you can watch dives live when they're happening. You can find information about the expedition, bios about all of us on board, mm -hmm. pictures, videos. There's also a tab called join us and that'll bring you to a site uh, called the ocean exploration trust. And on that site, you'll find the internships that are available for college and university students. So ROV piloting. Uh, science data collection, video production, right? We need somebody to work the cameras and take the images for us. There's also for informal and formal educators, the Science Communication Fellowship, which is what I'm doing right now. And for all you artists out there, the patch contest is open right now. And this is really cool. So every expedition season, there's a patch that is designed by a student somewhere in the world. So you can go and see examples of previous ones, design your own patch, send it in to us, and you never know, your patch could be given to all of the expedition team members for the 2019 season. So lots of really cool opportunities to become involved. So I've got a couple uh, things coming on my phone from people watching along. So the first one is from Jojo, an LSS student in grade seven in Dalian, China. And she's, oops, and she's, oh, I just lost them. There we go. And she's wondering, did we see any jellyfish down there and how many species did we see? Ooh, That's a good question. We, one species. we saw a couple for sure. I thought we saw some cone jellies yeah. and then those little black ones that were kind of sitting just above the bottom. Two. So I can think of two species for sure. Yeah. And the cone jellies, I think just a couple, but we did see a lot of those little um, black ones that were just hovering uh, along the bottom. So I'm not sure what those species were and the scientists weren't either. So we'll have to get an update because lots of times if we're not sure about something, scientists are also tuning in live and they'll send us in uh, some help or we can send pictures out afterwards and they can get us the answer because we know a lot, but we don't know everything. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We make our, we make our best guesses and sometimes we just make descriptions of them. <laughs> All right. Great question. Thank you, Jojo from China. Uh, Mrs. Lindsay's class, we're coming back your way. Your microphone's on. Do you have another question for us? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. What about sponges? Yeah. Uh, can the sponges, uh, like, absorb plastic? That oh. is an excellent question, and the answer is yes. So Amanda showed me an experiment where she had a beaker full of water and microplastics. She put a live sponge inside and left it for 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, the beaker was totally clear. All the microplastic had been absorbed by the sponge. Now, the sponge isn't getting any food from that, and it's probably not gonna fare too well afterwards, especially if there were toxins in the plastics or if the plastics clog up its channels. But it does show um, how powerful their suction is. And then scientists are looking at biomimicry. Can we replicate the suction force that the sponges are using to kind of filter and move water that efficiently? So that's pretty cool. And in fact, Jess, you do study uh, biomimicry. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, that's the area of my, my PhD right now, actually, is uh, biomimetics. And bio I work in a bio-inspired robotics and design lab over in the University of California, San Diego, under Dr. Mike Tully and uh, Dr. Dimitri Dehain. So um, yeah, so biomimicry is a fantastic way in order to look at some new novel designs that are more efficient and evolved by nature. So that means mm -hmm. there's millions of years of iterations on a design, if you will. <laughs> it's a yeah. bit better than what I can do when I'm sitting in my sitting at my desk. Um, but yes, no, it's a fantastic way in order to think of some maybe some filtration uh, seafloor cleanup apparatus. Yes, the um, bottom line, generally nature can do things better than, than we can. <laughs> yes. So sometimes stealing their designs can help us. <laughs> or not stealing, but utilizing Right. Them and then making, making them use later. of. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Mrs. Simon's class, your microphone's on again. If you guys have another question. Do you throw a Oh, 
all the creatures that you've found, what has been your favorite? Good question. Uh, let's see what we saw on the die that was my favorite. I am going to have to go uh, with the moose octopus. Even though we saw a lot of them, the fact that they were doing something unique uh, that had all the scientists perplexed, uh, the fact that they showed us that we really know nothing about what's going on at the bottom of our oceans, that was really exciting for me. And to be one of the first people to see this live and be able to beam it out all over the world at the same time, it was a really incredible moment. So even though they were pretty common, uh, and in other areas as well, seeing that new behavior and just adding another piece to the puzzle was really exciting. Oh, yeah. Well, that was definitely beautiful to see. And mm -hmm. I think my favorite creature um, is a flamboyant squid worm. <laughs> um, so for most of the, it's a very strange type of worm. I guess I have an affinity for invertebrates. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2015, we were doing a dive down in the Galapagos. And um, down there, amongst these hydrothermal vents, there's a beautiful landscape. But um, there's this worm that I was just fascinated by. It's a type of worm that has a segmented body and tentacles that come out the top, much like squid. And it has these hairs coming out the sides that reflect the light as in a rainbow. And it would dance in the water column. And we were just enamored by this worm as it danced. And uh, amongst all these hydrothermal vents as well, it was an impressive landscape. But my favorite type of worm and probably my favorite type of organism I've seen so far. Very cool. So we'll grab another question from online. This time it's from a uh, seventh grader in Panama City in Central America. Uh, what's the difference between animals in the Pacific versus other water bodies? So Jess, have you ever been on a cruise, uh, like any of the Gulf of Mexico legs or any of the other ones? Or have you always been in the Pacific? I've primarily done most of my work in the Pacific. Yeah, yeah we've been out this way for the majority of the time I've been on board. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but that, that's a very interesting question. And if you think of like a freshwater bodied organism versus a saltwater body, uh, you'll definitely see differences in how they will handle salts, for instance, how mm -hmm. their buoyancy changes in the water because the buoyancy, sorry, um, rather the density of, of um, the salt water is different than the density of fresh water, for yeah. instance. Yeah. And then even between the two, like the Atlantic and the Pacific, you're definitely going to see differences in organisms. Um, the Pacific tends to be a warmer ocean, I think, in most areas than a lot of parts of the Atlantic. There's that kind of land barrier with North America and South America that can kind of limit what can kind of move back and forth. But then sometimes you do see species that don't belong, invasive species. Right. So as a diver, um, I see lionfish when I dive in the Caribbean. Now, lionfish are native to the Pacific Ocean. There should be no way for them to get into the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean. But people in Miami like them in their fish tanks, but then they find out that they eat everything in the fish tank and they get really big. So instead of maybe killing them, which might have been the better option, they let them go in the ocean. And that's caused them to explode all up parts of the East Coast, all the way through the Gulf of Mexico, and all the way down now into Central uh, and even parts of South America. So sometimes invasive species can hitch a ride in tanker ships. Uh, humans release them on purpose or by accident. And then we can get species kind of jumping between ocean to ocean that way. Yeah. All right. Mrs. Pierce's class, your microphone is on. Um, where are you guys in the Nautilus ship right now that where you're talking to us? Good question. Why don't I pull up that picture one more time? uh of the nautilus and we can show you exactly where we're hanging out well the best we can anyways <laughs> there we go back to screen share all right so the screen should be sharing now and what do you think jess where about are we right now oh well right now we're steaming a bit south though so, uh... oh inside the ship though Oh, inside I think that's the what ship. Yeah. Oh, I am apologizing. Where we're broadcasting there. from. <laughs> Roger that. Okay. Um, yeah, so we are on the, what are we on the third deck up, second deck down? Is that a? Yeah, let me think. So there's. We the, can, maybe we can, maybe yeah. we can maybe better detail it out here. So this this pier is the bridge. Um, this is where the, seat, the captain kind of looks out. And then yeah. if you go one deck down, this is where we have our galley and uh, where we start to have our mess hall and we eat. And then we're down one more deck over here. Yep. Um, so we're along this line, along the Nautilus here. This is where we're broadcasting from. 
Currently. And then if you go one deeper, this is where I get to bunk right down here, this <laughs> row of portholes. It's pretty neat because sometimes you look up in the morning and the water splashing right up against the porthole. Right. So we're pretty much right level with the water down there. And what we're doing right now is pretty amazing. It's called telepresence. So we're able to talk to you right now. Our signal's beamed from this big golf ball looking uh, dome here. It has a satellite dish inside that can move back and forth with the, the waves and keep it in one spot. It's beamed up to a satellite in space, then down to the inner space station, which is a studio in Rhode Island, and then sent out to everybody who's watching us today. So that technology is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna stop the screen share and we're gonna come back. There we go, we should be back now. And we're gonna visit Mrs. Jerome's group again. Let me turn your microphone on. Oh, okay. oh. When you're down in the water, how long can you stay down before you have to ascend again? Great question. Um, from what I hear, uh, these were some of the longest dives ever done uh, by the Nautilus. Yeah, so really, uh, since we don't have people down in the water, since these are remotely operated vehicles, we're controlling them from the control van on the ship. Um, we can really send the vehicles down as long as one, the scientists are interested in that spot, as long as there's still space in our sample bins, and as long as there's still chocolate in our stomachs. No, yeah. no. <laughs> um, the it's chocolate a pretty good perhaps is a... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so right now we've been due dives, you know, anywhere upwards of a day, past a day. So I think we did a 36 hour dive yeah. at last. Yeah. Um, but really we're not limited by having people in the, in the submersibles. Yeah. Uh, and that really takes out a lot of that time pressure. It's really about until we get the job done. Um, so about maybe on average for this past leg, it was 30 some odd hours. Um, but we can yeah. stay longer or stay shorter depending, on, depending so, on what we want. Yeah. So RVs are great. They don't have to go to the bathroom. They don't, ha they don't get cold. They don't get hungry. So as long as we can get power down to them, really, they could stay down indefinitely. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great, great question. question. So let's see, I have another one coming in from online. This time, um, mm, this is from a ninth grader, Andre, wondering, looks like the ship is rocking heavily. Has anyone on board ever gotten seasick? <laughs> and uh, I've been fine. I think you've been okay as well oh, yeah, so I far. <laughs> but uh, a few of the scientists have had some rough, some rough mornings. They've, they've slept in a little longer. They've been taking a little bit of seasickness medication or using their, their patches. So yeah, seasickness is definitely a factor. Uh, but everybody I think has been doing pretty well. Nobody's fed the fishes. And I think you can guess what that means, feeding the fishes. <laughs> Nobody has done that, but there's definitely been some people who have spent some extra time in bed to try and find their sea legs and, uh, and get ready for uh, the expedition. The way I like to think about it is that um, humans aren't necessarily used to this type of motion. And so it takes people a couple of days to get their body to adjust. But once their bodies adjust, I mean, it's fantastic just how quickly um, and how versatile mm -hmm. your body can be, really. It can adjust to such changing conditions. Um, but no, I, I don't get seasick. But And that's why I love the sea state right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is pretty fun to sit on the back deck and watch the whole horizon and the water move around. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so just a few more reminders. Um, if you were tuning in today and you took some pictures, please do share them on Twitter. Use the hashtag uh, Explorer Classroom and tag them at Nacio Education. You can always find more of our upcoming Explorer Classroom events at Nacio uh, uh, Education. Or sorry, at um, I'm blanking on the website right now. So we'll just jump over that. If you go to Google and you look up Natio <laughs> Education, you can find our website. We have all the listings of our upcoming events. You can see what's coming up. And then please, if you're out there, take a look at the site. We'll be in the Channel Islands on the next leg of the expedition uh, for about two weeks before the season wraps up. If you're an artist, maybe a good classroom activity, send us some patch designs, because you never know, you could be the 2019 uh, winner of the contest. And think about being an intern in the future on board the Nautilus. You meet amazing people from all over the world, all different career backgrounds. You learn a ton. You have a lot of fun. And you get to see stuff that not many people get to do. You get to be first. So it's pretty awesome. Oh, all right. Well, Jess, thanks so much for taking some time from your day to hang out with us today, oh, boys and girls. 
As per usual, thank you for your amazing questions. And the last thing we'll do today, I'll turn all the microphones on. We'll let it get loud. Give us a big goodbye and thank you. And we'll sign off from EV Nautilus. So here we go. Microphones are on. Hey, everybody. All right. Thanks for hanging out.